like this first one from Mark. And Mark, you make me laugh every time. Um, we're now told that men can have babies and go through menopause. It's menopause, Mark. I thought you knew that. Um, are there natural solutions different for men than for women? So let's just get clear about reality. I think it's, it's, it's quite funny that um, the sociologists that call themselves scientists say that men can actually experience um, giving birth to babies and actually having, having this. It's a ridiculous and ludicrous statement, and I know you meant that as a joke, but um, um, it, it's really kind of a sad world where we have to, <laughs> where for fear of discrimination and for fear of, of, um, of being attacked by a mob, um, we espouse things that are completely ludicrous, like using the term birthing person instead of mother. Like it's an insult to mothers everywhere. Um, and no dads can't give birth. Um, men can't give birth and, and gender's not fluid. But anyway, let's, let's move on from that. Um, is it true that autoimmune disease improves or go into permanent remission after menopause? No, that's not true at all. Uh, I see lots of people, Dahlia, with autoimmune disease well beyond menopause. It's not true at all. Is it harder to build muscle after menopause than before? It is to a certain extent, but part of that depends on why you're, you know, you know, part of that depends on what you're doing. Um, I think where a lot of women struggle to build muscle, you know, postmenopausally has more to do with years and years of accumulated poor diet and poor behavior than it does with actual difficulty in gaining muscle. Although because you don't produce as much testosterone after menopause, and it is a little bit more challenging. I'm not going to say it's not, but it, it's, it's not a deal breaker. You should still be able to gain muscle. Um, let's see. I'm a 41-year-old bodybuilding and calisthenics enthusiast. Is there anything I need to change with regard to my training and diet when I hit menopause? Not really. I mean, not, not if you're doing the things that we talked about tonight already as far as solutions for it. So, I mean, continue to exercise, continue to get sunshine, continue to eat well, um, you know, manage your stress, drink clean water, breathe clean air. Those are really the fundamentals to, to a healthy um, outcome as you move toward menopause. Uh, let's see here. I blame gluten and poor medical advice for my hysterectomy. hysterectomy. I was forced into menopause early on very low doses of estrogen patch. I would like to get off fake hormones. Yeah, I would say, Aaron, you really want to work with somebody who understands that if that's your goal and you really want to move away from that. Uh, Tracy's asking, I'm postmenopausal and have osteoporosis. Anything that would not be recommended to take at this point? Um, it depends on what you mean. There's nothing that I would say don't take in, as far as like nutritionally, but there may be a number of medications I wouldn't recommend um, without adequate assessment. Because a lot of women at, with, with uh, postmenopausal osteoporosis, the first thing their doctors want to do is put them on bisphosphonates or other bone drugs, right? That preserve, actually that force calcium into the bone and make the bone look more dense on an x-ray, on a DEXA scan, but actually creates a more brittle bone. So it actually makes, get, gives a greater pronicity toward, uh, toward, toward microfracturing of bone. And we see this in the research studies on, on uh, the jaws where, where, where people develop osteonecrosis of their jaw and microfractures in their jaw as a result of taking these bone drugs. Um, in my opinion, they're not great drugs to take. Let's see here, Mary from Long Island, just wondered if it's safe to say that I have gotten any symptoms of menopause at 62, does it mean I have escaped it? You know, if you're in menopause, and you can confirm that. I mean, the way to confirm menopause really is, is in my opinion, is, is to do hormone testing to see what's happening, you know, with your estrogen, you know, mainly with your estrogen, your progesterone, your FSH, which is follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. Um, but if, you're, if your hormone levels are, are clearly menopausal, right, then yeah, you, you, you haven't escaped it. You've just, you've just gone through it in, in, in what I would call a healthy way where you, you weren't suffering through it. Again, menopause shouldn't be something you suffer through. Why do some women have menopause symptoms and, and other women don't have it? And I, 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 Cynthia, that's a great question. And I would say that the reasons are, 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 are pretty much what I drew on the board today. I mean, those are some of the biggest reasons as to why we see some being asymptomatic and others being severely symptomatic. 
Best way to test hormones. Um, you know, there's a lot of ways to test hormones. I'd say the best way is to just accurately assess them together. Um, you know, you could use a, you know, blood levels. Some, some doctors use salivary levels and some doctors use urine levels, but um, I would say get a good read on, on them together and, and consistently um, where whatever, it, whichever one that your doctor chooses is that they're monitoring them and they're repeating the same generally. So for example, if you do your estrogen, your estrone and your estradiol and your progesterone uh, all in the blood, and then you want to recheck them again in six months, then recheck them in the blood in six months. Don't recheck them in the saliva because there are definite variant differences amongst using different samples. So again, it's more, in my opinion, when you're testing them, it's more about consistency uh, because they, they can all have degrees of accuracy. Uh, early menopause at 37, total hysterectomy at 40, taken off HRT eight years ago, what to do with symptoms and problems at age 67? You gotta work with a, a good functional doc, Carol. Um, you know, most doctors are just gonna tell you to live with it. Most, you know, traditional style doctors are just gonna tell you to live with it, but you've gotta get proper assessment. In my opinion, what do you assess if you're struggling? You, you have to assess your nutritional status, number one. These nutrients are required to build hormones, and if you don't have adequate quantities of the right nutrients, you're not gonna build those hormones. But nutrients are also required to build hormone receptors, and nutrients are also required to help the hormones dock to the nucleus of your cell to communicate with your DNA about upregulation of the production of different proteins. So if your nutrient levels are low, you're, you can impact and affect hormones in a negative way in, through various different mechanisms. And so I think it's important that nutrition is checked very, very thoroughly. And it also would be a good idea to have yourself assessed for a gluten issue. It also would be very important to have yourself assessed for other food sensitivities or food allergies that might also be contributing to the abnormal symptoms that you're experiencing. Um, Rita wants to know about losing weight for somebody during this stage of life. Um, already follow, follow a no-grain, no-pain diet and, a no, and no typical symptoms. So if you're trying to lose weight, weight loss boils down to um, two primary things, really. In my experience, actually three. Um, so let's just make some room and, and help you understand that a little bit better. So number one, so we're talking about, again, we're talking about weight loss at this stage of life. Number one, calories. Now that's not the most important, but it's, it is important and you can overconsume calories and we'll talk more about it in just a second. Number two is a non-inflammatory lifestyle. Because if you're doing things within your lifestyle, even if you're following no grain, no pain, but you're doing other things that are driving the inflammatory process chronically, you're still gonna struggle because inflammation, again, that hormone cortisol, which increases blood sugar, which increases triglycerides, triglycerides are fat, and then you know that leads to fat storage or weight gain for many, right? It's not fat that always necessarily causes fat. That's why the keto diet for so many people is so successful. It's excessive, excessive glucose that is converted or, or converted into triglycerides or fat as a result of chronic inflammation. So this is a big one, a non-inflammatory lifestyle. And then three, it's exercise. And exercise is important in terms of how much quantitatively, like how much do you do, but also qualitatively, what kind do you do, right? Because if you're trying to lose weight, then in an effort to lose weight, one of the most effective ways with your exercise is to actually build muscle. And if you're not building muscle with the exercise that you do, and where a lot of people go wrong here is they just focus only on a cardiovascular type of activity. So they're on a treadmill, elliptical runner, a bike or something along that line. And these activities don't build muscle. You have to, if you wanna lose weight, you've gotta build muscle because building muscle increases your basic metabolic rate, which is the quantity of calories you burn at rest. And so the more lean mass you have, the easier it is to maintain a healthy body weight. So these three things are, th are the top three things that I would say, investigate them. 
a lot of times people are doing number two and number three perfect, right? And they're just not, they've never counted. They don't know to count and they're just over hitting the mark. Like they're eating, you know, in an excess of a thousand calories a week. And so there's no weight loss. And in effect, there's actually a little bit of weight gain. It's slow and steady weight gain, but it's, it's weight gain nonetheless. So sometimes, you know, again, I'm not a big fan of starting here, but you do have to, if you're doing these other things right, you do have to come back and look at calories as a, as a measure, right? And there are a number of tracking tools that you can use to measure calories. But again, as a generalized rule, you know, 3,500 calories equals one pound of fat. And so, um, you know, if you're, if you're over consuming your caloric value by this much every week, then you gain a pound a week, right? Or if, if maybe you're not, not, maybe it's not quite that high. Maybe it's, you know, again, maybe you're getting an extra 1500 calories a week, which equivalent, you know, if you, if you look at, at this, this could just be a couple of hundred calories a day that you're overeating. And so it's driving that half pound of, of weight gain a week or so, you know, so you do have to look at calories at some point, you know, if you're struggling, right? If you're not struggling, don't bother. Don't waste your time counting. But a lot of people, uh, you know, they forget about that part or, they, or they've or they been told that calories are less important. There are a lot of people out there, you know, talking about these other two things. And that's smart because these two things should be emphasized more than this thing. But this thing, it still matters. It's still important. Okay. Let's scroll down on the left. Okay. Within my 70s, do I still have... Uh, why in my 70s do I still have hot flashes? Been on no grain, no di pain diet or no grain diet for over a year. I take your vitamins and still have night sweats. Did, did have a hysterectomy in my 40s. So this is a case, Barb, where, um, you know, you may not have any estrogen. You know, if you, had a, if you had a full hysterectomy, again, whether you had a full hysterectomy or partial hysterectomy, a full hysterectomy means you don't have any great way to produce estrogen on your own. And so again, that not having adequate estrogen can drive hot flashes and could explain why you're still having them at such a late age. I would have your doctor, ask your doctor to measure those levels and make sure that you're, you know, you're not a candidate. Some women are truly candidates, especially post hysterectomy. Now, again, um, I know different pe doctors, different people have different opinions on hormone therapies, but some women are candidates for estrogen therapy. And it's the ones, in my opinion, that are specifically are the ones that have a total hysterectomy and struggle. So let's see. Um, I don't sweat like I shouldn't have it for many years. Is this due to menopause or my sweat glands not working anymore? If you, you know, generally, Sandy, people that don't sweat, um, have a toxicity issue, at least in my experience. And so there may be something, you know, a food toxicity and environmental toxicity that your, um, your body's overwhelmed by and the sweating mechanism is no longer effectively being engaged. That's a possibility and one I see quite common. Let's scroll down on the left. Uh, Mark was asking, some postmenopausal women who were jabbed are now having their periods again. What should they do? Yeah, I know that's a that's a tough one. And probably the best thing to do is, in my experience and opinion, is to take in acetylcysteine NAC um, for several reasons that I won't get into tonight. But um, you know, post post jab NAC is one of the key elements that I recommend people take in higher quantities. And so again, anywhere between one and three grams, that's 1,000 and 3,000 milligrams a day um, post jab for those types of symptoms. How do you feel about HRT, hormone replacement therapy? Um, I'm not opposed to it, but I'm also not pro HRT for everyone just because. Now some, you know, I'm, I, far be it for me to judge anybody's choices that they wanna make about their health. Now that being said, um, you know, there are risks to HRT, right? But there are also risks to not having adequate hormones, right? So it's this, it's this balancing game. You have to, this is why it's so important to get them assessed and have a good doctor who will monitor them periodically to assess them to help you understand what your needs may or may not be. I think my, the, the issue I see that's problematic is women that go on HRT 
they do no testing. There's no objective evaluation. They just go on HRT, and if their symptoms improve, they're like, okay, that's the right amount. And there's a risk to these, to these medicines, but again, there's also a risk to not having any estrogen. Like there's increased risk for heart diseases, increased risk for cancer. There's increased risks for um, a number of problems with too much hormones, but the same is true on the opposite side. There's increased risk for not enough. And so I think uh, if you're considering HRT, one, it has to be a quality of life issue. Your quality of life has to be so poor and, and, and again, um, if you're if you're leaning in that direction, whoever you're getting your prescription from, you really want to have them monitor you on a regular basis. One of the things I don't like with HRT, just again, this is my opinion, is this the pellets that they implant under the skin, and that's just because if the dose is too strong, the, generally the life cycle of those pellets is about three months or so, and so you're stuck with that too high of a dose for multiple. Uh, months potentially, and that could lead to problems. So again, I don't, I don't like if you're trying to figure out what you should take. I'm, I'd recommend that you talk to your doctor about oral medication if you're leaning in that direction versus the pellets under the skin or any other type of, of method of delivery. Hey, if you've got a functional medicine or health question that you'd like me to answer for you, make sure you send me an email, glutenology at gmail.com, and we'll do our best to create a video answer just for you. Have a great day.